and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Justin Terrell. Here. Michael O'Keefe. Here. Okay, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. David Lane. Here. Peter Kerpusik. I'm here. Stephen King. Here. Aaron Salufo. Aaron is not here yet. Okay. And Richard Souza. Here. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. David Lane. Here. Peter Kerpusik. Here. David Lane and Stephen King. Here. Here. Good afternoon. This open meeting of the Water and Sewer Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public hearings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. At this meeting, the Water and Sewer Commission is convening remotely via the WebEx app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, Please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the meeting. Meeting materials. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website as otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda and the side of Holy Rybicki note otherwise. Meeting business ground rules. We're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do, do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For items with public comment, we have established an email address for public comment, which is public comments at danversma.gov. Danvers I'll repeat that again, public comments at danversma.gov. This email address is also posted with the agenda and, shows, and is shown online with the streaming of this meeting. Resident with email comments, and they will be provided and read out loud after the staff has confirmed their name and address. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Without any further ado, I would like to get to the first meeting on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is David Lane. One final comment. Um, yes, please. For public comment, we also have, are monitoring a phone line that was advertised on the agenda. The phone number is 978-777. 0001 extension two, and we're, we have staff monitoring that line for public comment. Uh, 
Uh, item one on our agenda was the executive order, which I have just gone through and has been subsequently added to by Dave Lane. Item number two, the COVID-19 operational update. Over to you, David Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to give the board the update that once the emergency started, the uh, town manager, he put the town onto a skeleton crew at first. We just worked to just keep the essential services, keep the water system going. We had a number of safety guidelines implemented right from the Mass Waterworks, from the governor's uh, policies on construction. Uh, kudos to the Rich and the Water Division that they kept operating, kept operating the treatment plant in a safe manner. Uh, we did it with obviously limited crew, but everybody chipped in, did their part. Uh, since that time, we're on to an A, and we went on to an A and B shift, split the shift in half. Um, still keep going with uh, many, many of our projects, and most importantly, kept the construction projects going. You'll hear more about that from Stephen King later. Uh, however, we got um, clear guidance from the governor early on on how to keep the construction projects going, and we were able to do so. Um, at this point, we have the water and sewer division staff. They are back to full full. Uh, full staff working out in the field. We've done a number of safety measures, such as they sh uh, the shift is staggered. They have the personal protective equipment. We have a whole safety policy uh, related to COVID, COVID that they've adopted. Uh, we do apologize to our customers that we have not been able to open up our business office during this period. However, Peter and his staff have worked very hard to continue all those services. Uh, I, I know I've been involved in a number of them that we were passing word along and whether it's a house closing, a new service, any of those type of thing, we've kept it going, uh, doing it remotely, and we're getting people to pay their bills, whether it's a drop-off box, whether it's online, payments are getting processed. Uh, we do appreciate the patience from the residents. Things take a little bit longer, uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, this part took a little longer than we expected, you know, to get uh, payments credited to the bills and to the accounts and such, but um, we've picked up the speed on that a lot. and. Um, I uh, commend the staff on how they've operated and, and just kept things going. Um, I guess, and that's all we want to say about just the COVID update, unless you guys had questions. Any questions from members of the board? Question, were there any costs that, okay, that the water department had occur, added costs because of the COVID, such as the PPE and other, other steps? Uh, yes, so we bought um, disinfection, hand wipes, disinfection, you know, wipes to wipe down the equipment. We have uh, fogging equipment that we can, that we purchased, that we can walk through the offices and, and uh, disinfect the offices. We actually bought a washing machine so that the crew could wash their uniforms at work, wouldn't have to have any contamination at home. Uh, so mostly personal protective equipment and stuff to keep things clean. And um, a number of those costs, Rich and other staff put together a um, submittal with the town accountant last Friday under the CARES Act. And so we've done a submittal under that and we're keeping a close watch on any costs that we might be able to send to FEMA also. <coughs> Great, thank you. This is Coley Rybicki, Water Department Chair. I would just like to commend you for uh, keeping the town's website updated. I was on there the last couple of days and I was able to see some of the activity the department's been up to with respect to a couple of recent breaks. And I, uh, kudos to you for keeping that updated and getting the information out that way. You know, certainly this commission would be interested in stuff like that. And, you know, with my citizen hat on, it was great to be able to go to the website, get the update and see what the impacts were and what the updates are. So uh, kudos, kudos to the team for, uh, for doing that. There's no further discussion. Do we have anything from the online or any residents yet? David, are they going to let you know when a question comes in? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we'll let you know when we have a pertinent question. Okay, I'll just proceed then until you tell me that we've got a question. Then. Perfect. Okay. Item number three on the agenda is a vote to approve the minutes of our previous meeting, which was March 5th, 2020. Um, Lee King distributed those minutes the other day through email to us. Um, was there any question on the meeting minutes? And if there isn't, I'll entertain a motion from a member of the board to accept those. And 
please remember to identify yourself each time we speak so anybody watching or listening at home knows what's going on. Any sure, questions this is, in a minute? No questions. This is Justin Terrio. I have motion to approve. Okay. Second. I'm Michael Keefe, second. All in favor? I need to do a roll call vote on this since we are voting on something. Uh, Justin? Aye. Aye. Mike? Aye. Okay. And Colin Wright Baker accepts them too. So our minutes are officially accepted. Item number four on our agenda is Pete Kropusik, who's going to give us a financial update. Over to you, Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have before us the uh, May 31st, 2020 financials. And um, if we start with the water, we can see that at, through the end of May, we're 98.8% uh, uh, on our way to collecting the uh, funds we need for this year's operation for the water and on the sewer side, we're 97.3% of the way there. Um, this morning I went in and uh, checked our cash receipts on both of those utilities. And um, through today, we have in fact uh, collected enough money uh, to satisfy the budget of both those utilities. Um, however, there is some news that, uh, you know, through May, from ju last July through May, our water sales uh, are down 3.2%. Um, the um, sales for the commercial is down substantially in e each of these last couple months, uh, uh, like 30%. And our residential dampers, uh, whether it be uh, single family homes or the big apartment complexes, have been up approximately um, 10%. So we uh, Collected enough for this particular year, but the sales are down uh, substantially. And um, a lot of it has got to do with the businesses. And if the businesses stay out for a while, um, that may present a, a, a problem going forward. And that's all I have on that subject, Mr. Chairman. Any questions from the board members? Hearing none, I'll accept the motion to accept the financials as presented by Peter Korpisek. This is Justin Terrio, motion to uh, accept the financials. A second, please. This is Michael Keefe, a second. All those in favor, uh, roll call again. Uh, Michael Keefe? Aye. Justin Terrio? Aye. Holy right, Becky. Aye. Financials are accepted. On to our next item. Item number five is preliminary discussion of the fiscal year 2021 water and sewer rates. Um, I assume this is going to be led by Pete Korpisik with David Augmenting. David Lane. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. This is David Lane. Let me give a, a quick introduction and then I'm probably going to hand off the detailed uh, discussion over to Coley, uh, Rodney and to Peter. Uh, <clears throat> Just so that everyone's aware, tonight we need to talk about the financials, the, how they look for next year, how the water uses look for next year. Um, we actually need to have a debate tonight on what would be a good possible rate to set uh, for next year. Uh, the information that we've sent you has multiple rates with multiple calculations on it. Uh, and then what we need to do is set a uh, date for the end of the month. And on that date, we would have two meetings. First, a meeting to where we would actually vote on the presentation of an actual water rate and then have a hearing following that meeting. At that public hearing, you would uh, actually set the rate. Any questions on that process by the board? Uh, I have none. Justin Terrio, no, no questions. Michael Keith, no questions. Thank you, board members. The First part that we need to talk about when we try to set the rate is figuring out how much water we're going to sell. And which is this is with a big surprise this year. One of the charts that Rodney and Peter put together and that we presented to you is called Town of Danvers Water Usage History. It goes back to 2010. And the 
biggest number to look at is the line that says total CF, total cubic feet. So this is total cubic feet of water that we sold. And if you look at the trends, the trend is downward. We used to do this on a five-year average of sales, then a three-year average of, then we changed, that didn't work. And we changed it to a three-year average. Then it's, we've looked at each year, we, over the past three years, we have not made our sales quota. We've been able to come in just somehow by, you know, revenues are somehow just squeaking by, but we've just barely making it. And this year, especially going in with low water sales right now with the COVID emergency going on, the recommendation before you tonight is to predict for next year's sales equal to what 2020s are. And the number that's on the sheet there for you is 124, 792, 173. So that's just 174, 700,000 cubic feet of water. It's well below what the three-year average is, but our recommendation is to go with what we're going to sell this year. And if we go with the three-year average, we're going to have a tough time meeting that and then a tough time meeting revenues. In 2020, we had very surprising July. We had never been under, you know, 10 million cubic feet in July, but it was a very wet July this year. Uh, so the sales were down. Thus, you know, end of the year, the, the number was low at the 124, 124 million. However, and we always say, if we had a real dry winter, or real, I mean, a very hot summer, even with the restrictions, we would sell slightly more water. Uh, than we're predicting here. However, it just hasn't seemed to happen over the next few years. So that's the biggest thing is, and all we know is that if we're looking at budgeting a lower number of sales, that means we have to get more revenue through the rate, and that would mean a rate increase. Uh, so I want to start out the meeting talking about that. So if we have any questions or debate on what we're going to use next year for a water usage sales number. Yeah, this is Coley right, Vicki. Uh you know, and thanks for all the information that's been sent to us over the last day or so. Um, with respect to some of the conditions that you just mentioned with the businesses and what's going on with the residential right now, what assumptions did you make in those categories for the remainder of the year? Uh, this is Peter Kerpusik. We uh, didn't make assumptions by category. We went with total sales throughout the system um and um that's what we use just total sales for the whole system and we we've used as david said the sales we're going with the going to use the uh, volume of sales that we have through uh july to june of um this, this fiscal year i i guess my question is i i, I understand that the three-year average isn't going to work because we've got some extraordinary events going on right now. But I mean, we're three months into this pandemic, and I don't think the pandemic's letting up anytime soon. Wouldn't we just take the three months that we've experienced right now and roll that through the end of the year rather than still rely on some historical figures that don't take that into consideration? Uh, I suppose we could. Um, it, it's a, we didn't approach it that way. I guess we're a little more optimistic that ho hopefully it, it'll work out. But um, I understand what you're saying. If this continues the second wave, um, we, we could have a problem. But right now we're um, we're anticipating that we'll sell as much as we sold last year. Um, because, and, and, you know, part of that, too, is as we've been in the office, people have been, we've had more requests to fill in pool, uh, fill pools and how much that would cost. And even on the news, we see, you know, people fill in pools and there's been more requests for irrigation meters and things. So, um, uh, although it won't totally offset it, if we had a full year of the commercial being down, um, you know, we're optim optimistic that maybe we'll have some more residential sales. So this is Coley Rebicki again. 
I guess I'm just applying a common sense filter to it. We we have hotel rooms around, et cetera, that are going unoccupied. Mm -hmm. Businesses that haven't returned to work at large businesses in town that are still, you know, have employees working from home, which I get, which is probably driving residential up. But you know, if you take a look at Cherry Hill, my guess is a lot of those major corporations in there still have their employees at home. I, I just think we're in for a bigger hit on the on the commercial side. Michael Keith, I, I agree with Coley. I think that the commercial hit's gonna be crazy. And if we're de depending on the residential, residential usage, a lot of residents are putting low, low flow fixtures and that stuff, low flow shower heads, so they're not gonna be using as much water in the residential. So I really don't think we can depend on the residential side carrying it. Uh, this is Peter again. We certainly, I could certainly break that out and, um, you know, look what it would be like if we have um, um, reduced uh, commercial for the rest of the year. We certainly, I certainly can do that. Thank you. This is Coley again, I guess. Um, you know, we've, we've only got one month. We technically, we only have one month left in our current fiscal year for water and sewer. So I'm just trying to think if we ran this through the rest of the year, what would it look like for this year's financials? But that's kind of a moot point because we're going to go set a new rate for next year. So I guess it comes back to the modeling. What model are we going to use for the remaining year? So. And this is David Lanigan. When we we've never projected a, a number as low as this, based on averages before when we've gone into our projections. And when we look back at 2020, that first month of 2020 was our historic low for that month. So if we're trying to match that, even with the commercial that is closed, it seems like we're gonna hit it. Although uh, I agree with the board, it'd be good for Peter to take a look at those and we'll do a breakout of commercial and residential uh, projections for this year to do that and see how, you know, how we're doing right now in, in April, May and June on commercial and just see what kind of a hit we're taking. And I would go compare that to January, February, yeah. I guess I just don't see that trend that trend letting up. This this thing is not going to be over and we're not going to get back to full capacity this year, I don't think. I agree. I'm go keep this. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, and then I guess the, the next step would be to, to talk about the financials. And I guess we should, we can start with water. And I'm looking at the, which water sheet do we want to take them to Peter or Rodney? I, I think Dave, the, the one that we had, um, the one for the water, that's the pretty blue where Rodney put together what we were expecting to have um, the retained earnings and stuff. Yeah. So for, um, this is Colin Rybicki, chair speaking again. Um, people know the respect I have for how this department is run. Um, before we get into the numbers, you just talked about the sales. Can you just walk the board up the mountain in terms of what other budget assumptions you made before putting the numbers together so we're on the same playing field in terms of what you were thinking? Um, we took the um, the budget that's in, uh, this, we're, we're hoping to get passed at town meeting for the, um, you know, for the, Well, 
I think we just lost Peter. The operational budget. We have so that takes uh, the operating budget, the the debt service, the salaries and wages, capital outlay. I'm, you can't Michael, hear me, Michael. Can, can you hear me, Dave? Me. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. So we took all the we took the, all the parts of the budget that we hope to have uh, approved the town meeting. Uh, the warrant articles that we hope to have approved the town meeting, and then we take the rate and put them against um, the volume of volume of water for the year that we expect to sell, and then we see whether that um, that volume of water against the uh, assumed rates will generate enough revenue to be greater than um, that, than the expenses hopefully to be approved for the year. So this is Coley Rybicki, Chair. I, I did take a look at some of the materials that were sent to us. So am, am I assuming correctly, or should I, I'm jumping ahead, maybe I should wait, but it looks like all the modeling that we were given starts at a 4% rate increase. Is that assuming that that's the minimum you think you need right now to get by, or is that the jumping off point? So the, the three, yes. Uh, before you tonight is three proposals a on the water side a 5% rate increase a 5.5% rate increase and a 6% uh that's that's based on the uh, 1,247 uh, and on that chart you can see at the top here they do have the breakout of the residential and the commercial and our sales are 65% residential 35% commercial that's that's how traditionally it breaks out and then once you take those the that rate and those rate increases proposed and then you, you walk down through the, the budget and the expenditures total revenue total um total revenue and then total expenses at the end we get to either a surplus or a deficit and we always try to budget a rate that's going to give us a slight surplus so at a 5% rate increase, right now it's calculated that we would have a surplus of $123,000.093. We believe that's quite tight. And anything less than that, we'd be, uh, we'd have to be, it'd be, we'd be concerned that we would not make the budget. So if it's 65, 35 historically, what's it been over the last 12 weeks? How much did it flip? Do we know? Yeah, that's the number that we don't, I don't think we have for you tonight, Coley. Okay, all right. If even in a in a five percent rating a five percent rate increase, so we end up with a, a slight surplus. So essentially, that and that with the retained earnings, if, if Rodney, could you take us through that retained earnings box down there in the bottom left? Yeah. So we're doing a couple of projections here. We're projecting how FY twenty ends. Um, and then projecting based on a 5% rate where we end up at the end of FY21. So the goal would be to end FY21 with a slight surplus in that year and then add it to the existing retained earnings, we would be at 18%. Now our policy is to at least maintain 10%. Um, and this is probably a good year to show why we, you know, caution the 10% to the minimum um, in case you have a major drop in usage. Um, and then moving forward, although 18% may seem on paper to be high, a little bit higher than the 10%. If you look into the out years, once we start adding the debt on, um, as long as with Stephen King's five-year capital project schedule, we're really gonna drain that right down to close to 10% very quickly. So I think the concern is if we were to go under five, we might not hit our target in FY21. And then we also want to avoid um, what we had to do last year, if you remember, which was a, a, a more sizable rate increase. We're trying to smooth it out and try to avoid any future double-digit rate increases if possible. 
Perfect. Thank you, Rodney. And with the retained earnings being above, it's by slightly above our 10% minimum threshold, we're doing two things. We have, we're creating that fund to, to have money available for those future capital projects. And the flip side of that, we also have those funds there in emergency. If in fiscal 21, we don't meet our sales, we have that, that extra 7% retained earnings. That's our safety net that we can go back and theoretically could ask the town to appropriate towards water revenues. I'd say that's a you know real emergency situation, but if we just had the sales drop totally, I think that's one place we can go to look for the for the funds. So this is only right, Vicky, again, for purposes of people that might not be on the WebEx. Um, we went through this issue last year when we had the big rate increase because we wanted to hit that 10% number for the bond rating, if I remember the conversation. We had extensive conversation on that. So I, I understand the driver here. I, I, I'm taking a look at the fiscal year 2021 and I see the 123K, which I understand we need the retained earnings and then cushion. So, projections right now, until we see revised numbers from, or given what's going on in the last 12 weeks, that's got us both profitable you know, with my minuscule accounting brain. But what happens in 2021 if I look to the right? What, why would we be forecasting that big of a loss? If Mm -hmm. you, you go, that's a half a million dollar swing. Mm -hmm. And I think we should we should be budgeting put money into retained earnings or our income statement should reflect break even or better. But why are we projecting such a big loss in 20? <laughs> Coley, where do you see the loss projection? Could you take me to where you're looking at that? Yeah, the 486, 458 number, right at the 123. Total surplus, a deficit. So in FY 2022, we're adjusting a $100,000 yeah, deficit. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Rodney Conley again. So if you look uh, a couple of uh, columns up, the capital projects, we have about $1.3 million in capital projects uh, scheduled for FY22. So that would lead to um, a loss overall in the year, but again, it would eat into our retained earnings and that's still with a 4%. So again, uh, sort of a common theme, which we'll talk about when we get to sewer as well, is you know, the cost of maintaining the system uh, put tremendous pressure and is trying to balance maintaining some retained earnings and also generating enough revenue to pay for some of these capital projects. So you see a, a drop in 22 and 23, a slight rebound in 24, and then a drop in 25, all being somewhat absorbed by being a little bit over the 10% projected and retained earnings. So, so, so Rodney, your plan is to Are you paying for that loss through retained earnings? Yeah, so historically our warrant articles are either paid through through retained earnings as a pay as you go, or they're bonded, um, in which case they're absorbed into the operating budget in the form of debt service. Um, obviously, preferably it's to pay as you go, so you avoid significant interest costs over the long term and stacking debt. But again, those are the two options. But yeah, these are the capital projects warrant articles line assumes that retained earnings would be paying for those warrant articles. Which would explain the drop from the 1.7 to 1.2 year over year, 22 to 21. Correct.
Um, I guess the chair has a question for, for David Lane. David, what's what's the what's the key driver in the 2022 capital? Are we going to go over that? We're probably going to discuss this year's capital cup coming, right? And the curiosity of me is why is that up so much in the fall? What are we doing? You want to take a second and pull that up, David. Oh, Michael, I don't think he realizes he's muted. I'm sorry for that. Yes. So the as we see that the fiscal 2020 capital, which is listed there, which are projects that are run well underway, high priority projects, the chlorine booster station and the carbon filter replacement are literally must do things. In fiscal 2021, we also kept our projects at the very high level priority projects. The well, well two and well one rehabilitation, 311,500. That's money that we absolutely need to spend to keep our wells going. The SCADA $230,000 upgrade. We need to get the SCADA system working so we can communicate with all of our stations. Uh, this is half what it was previously thought to be to cost. The staff has done a great job bringing that number down. However, this has to do with the whole change in the, the phone system, the removal of the copper lines, and we need to get new SCADA communication with our stations. The, the last one, the GIS 38,500. Um, that could be is the only one of the three that's classified as maybe not a must do, but it's just been so long since we've done a GIS flyover of the town. It's something that the whole town uses uh, on a daily basis, and we just thought that that was a, a modest amount to get into this year. So we feel we've taken the capital projects down to an absolute minimum, a bare minimum for this year. If the, uh, I hate repeating my name because I don't have that kind of a need for purposes of the phone. This is Coley Rybicki again. I guess um, if, the whole town, if the whole town uses that, is there a chance for us to charge back to them some of that cost rather than us picking up the whole tab? Yes, yeah, so we do do charges back through to the town through our support services. It goes back with the, we pay the town for some support services, they pay us back. So there will be a, a uh, the, the other town departments will pay us back through that process that Peter and Rodney developed. We've caught, kept, you know, some funds get paid to water and sewer, others get paid back to the town. I, I, I'm just talking for that flyover. So we would, we would charge some of that back? Yeah, yeah, it will, yeah, so it's because we're the water and sewer is the primary user of it, We'll fund the cost of it, but then when it comes to the mapping and, and such and the licensing to continue that, other departments will pay for that. But we just thought it would be best for because we're the primary users of the of that of that uh, information that that we would pay for it out of water and sewer this time. We think the town actually has worse budget issues than water and sewer have probably right now. Yeah, so I, I guess um, my um, my thinking at this point is that a, re a review of what's going on in the last twelve weeks and how we're going to account for that and our numbers going forward is paramount. Paramount. Any rate this discussion depending upon what we see in those numbers, you know, I, I just get the fact-based business decisions depending upon what that looks like. Um, I think we're going to have a little bit of more number crunching to do to figure out what the right number is. I guess 
at this point, based upon what I've seen, I, I'm just not comfortable with pro projections and not taking into account what we've seen in the last weeks and what we're expecting to see going forward. Sure, uh, this is David Lane. We'll put no, we'll put that information together on on that split and what our actual sales were in those categories. Uh, even do a little projection going forward. See what we think to get us through the summer. Uh, that'll give the board some more information there. Um, if other things come up, if the board wants us to run our, our rate analysis that sends us in any kind of direction, we're, we're glad to do that before the next meeting. Uh, and then obviously we'll have a, another debate about these numbers uh, at the next meeting before we, and then we'll have the to be followed then by the rate hearing. Um, we try to have the rate hearing in June to have it ready to go on July 1st. Um, if for some reason everything gets, um, we get bogged down in trying to establish that, we do have a, a couple more weeks. You know, if we do it by, if we have to have another meeting at the beginning of July, we can do that. Yeah. I, I would only have, only right, Vicky, again speaking, I would probably have two minor asks for that process. One, go through what you just articulated. Um, I'm also wondering if there's a key metric there that tells us for each, pick your number, right? For each million dollar drop in water gallon sold means X amount percentage increase to the bill or the rate. You know, some metric like that to help us get our heads around, what are we looking at? Mm -hmm. It's going to be some. Sure. It's got to be some common sense metric there that we can take a look at. That's I'll call it a key indicator. What would be the two key indicators that would alter our thought process if things continue to go the way they're going? And then um, number two, I probably share the collective wisdom of the board. If we could see those numbers, maybe three or four, three or four days in advance of the meeting, so we can do our homework on them. I mean, we just got a lot of stuff pumped into our inboxes today. I just like to be careful. You know, we can have a good thorough rate discussion on it. So if we could get those numbers three or four days before we actually go into that rate setting meeting, that would be, I think, good for for me. And I don't want to be speaking for all the other board members, but I think these are interesting times. These are complicated times, and we think that um, we would be doing our our due diligence on the numbers for the benefit of the community if we didn't see those a little bit earlier so we could digest them. Yes, well, uh, that's a very reasonable request and we'll take care of all three of those. Thank you. I guess I will just, um, at this point in time, uh, give an opportunity for Justin Terrioth or Michael Keith, if you guys would like to add anything to the discussion. At this, hey, Michael Keith here. Um, at this point, Coley, you've pretty much covered everything that I wanted to say. So at this point, I don't have anything to add. This is Justin. Same thing, nothing additional to add at this time. All right. Um, anything for members of the, the town government that are on the phone? Anything else you'd like to add? Anybody? That item before I move on? Uh, no, we just uh, need to remember um, the, uh, for the end of the meeting to come back and, and set the date for the next meeting and the date of the hearing. Okay, yeah, we can do that at the end. We'll remind each other. Thank you. Okay. okay. Item number six, project updates. Uh, David Lane, over to you and direct out as you see fit. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Rebecca. I think I'm going to defer this over to Steve King. Uh, Steve King and I met, and he's prepared to give us a, a brief update of the, the projects that are underway right now and uh, how those are going. Yeah, good evening. Thanks, to, uh, Mr. Chairman and David. Uh, the past few months certainly has been some challenging for uh, Water and Sewer Division and also engineering uh, to obviously make sure our projects are still moving forward, uh, even though a lot of a lot of things have kind of been in delay status because uh, of COVID. So uh, we've been working hard, uh, both remote and in the field, to make sure our uh, contractors are, are staying on their schedule uh, as far as construction. And then also projects that we have in the fold are, are moving along for, for, for bid in the near future. 
Um, so I, I think I'll take you through all the water projects that we have going on right now. And then at the end of the water, I'll take any questions that uh, the board and chairman may have um, to answer them. And then I'll move on to our sewer and, and stormwater projects. So just moving on, the first project I'd like to catch up on is the Swan Pond a raw water booster station project. Uh, that's our boosters, that's our pumping station that's located at Swan Pond in North Reading. Uh, we're doing a rehabilitation of the pump station. Uh, we have a contractor work in Sherburn Consolidated. Uh, they're right now they're approaching substantial completion by July. We have power to the system. Um, all the mechanical work is done, all the HVAC work is done. Uh, we're waiting on a few of the exterior uh, uh, improvements that we need to do as far as a new vault hatch on the um, on the intake valve and then some other um, changing out some of the the valve valve meter pit um, castings so as far as that project goes it's it's been on schedule a uh, contractor has been really good to work with uh, he's been there working there every day and uh, that project's moving along and we're hoping to be able to fully utilize that by uh, july of this year the next project, uh, the chlorine booster station that's located at our Folly Hill water storage tank. Uh, that one has been a little bit of a challenge uh, that requires uh, us to shut down the tank for a, a week to install the new vault uh, and, and mechanical pieces for the station. Um, due to COVID, we've, while we were running on a skeleton crew, um, we didn't want to tax our, our water system and demand by taking off that tank just for fire protection and, and flow overnight. So um, we've been able to kind of readjust the contractor schedule, uh, do as much of the work as we can uh, at the site by starting the electrical on the ground conduit, um, bring, you know, arrive, mobilizing the vault, uh, starting to do form work for the, for the foundation, for the booster station, um, basically get, try and get everything as, as close to ready as we can, as soon as we can take the tank offline, we're able to do that. Uh, the contractor will mobilize back, uh, install the vault, and then continue uh, finishing the project. So, right now we have an estimated timeline of completion uh, late fall of this year, and restoration work will probably continue into 2021 in the spring to, to close out the project. Uh, as you might have uh, heard David spoke a little bit earlier about, was the water treatment plant carbon filter rehab project that we had approved at town meeting last year. Uh, we have a contractor um, ready to go. He has all the materials in place. Um, he's currently looking to store them at our facility and he'll be ready to uh, start mobilizing and doing the work uh, to replace uh, our carbon filter one and two uh, porous plates and, and filter beds uh, at the water treatment plant. Uh, again, that's a, a crucial timing a uh, piece of construction. Uh, we have to be careful about taking one of those carbon filters offline. Uh, we don't want again to want to attack the system uh, at a at a point where we're at a high demand during the summer peak season. Um, so we're just looking to coordinate that once we have uh, a lower demand threshold. And kind of tying into that as well is also the Buxton Road Green Sand Filter uh, Rehabilitation Rehab Rehab Project. Uh, that is one that is on the town meeting warrant for this year. That is uh, a project that's dedicated to removing and replacing loosening uh, green sand and anthracite that's uh, in the vertical pressure filters at our treatment plant. That basically takes out the iron and manganese um, from our well system uh, at well two, which is located just off of Route 114. Um, <clears throat> we've gone ahead and we've kind of been proactive. Uh, we have everything set to go. We'll be opening bids on the 15th. Uh, once we have town meeting approval on the 22nd, the official town meeting approval, uh, we'll go ahead and start awarding and executing that contract for the contractor to come in and start replacing that green sand. Once that's done, uh, we'll be able to actually turn well two back on uh, and, and fully utilize its uh, 1 million gallons uh, daily average based on uh, river flow. So that project is uh, continuing on. The Green Street Water Booster Station, uh, at this point, the project is 99% complete. Uh, we're just waiting a, a final pay estimate and, and hard copies of the operating and maintenance manuals uh, from the contractor. Uh, Aqualine was in the past few weeks to do the restoration work, uh, the pavement, uh, some fencing around the site, and, and some lumen seed. 
Uh, other than that, everything is is working. I've gotten a few calls about people excited to have new water pressure. Um, so it definitely has made a, a big improvement in that area. And I believe the majority of the residents uh, in that new pressure zone have been uh, grateful that we did that project. So it's been good to hear that and that feedback from the residents. Uh, last major project that we have on the streets right now is the Hobart and Center Street water main project. Uh, that was awarded uh, to a contractor, R&D site development back in the winter time. Uh, he mobilized early April um, and started on work doing a cross, connect, cross connection across Route 1 northbound and southbound lanes uh, prior to the, uh, the new project that's paving all of Route 1 for Mass DOT. Um, so luckily we were able to get in there at a, at a timely fashion. Uh, it was some hard work for the contractor, but he, he did an excellent job crossing Route 1. Uh, there weren't any issues. Uh, luckily we were also able to work during the day versus the nighttime because of the reduced traffic flow on Route 1. So I think that really helped progress our schedule along. Uh, as soon as he finished that project, he mobilized right over to Hobart Street, uh, started setting up his bypass, uh, worked with National Grid, who was also out there replacing installing a new high pressure gas main on the street. And uh, to date, the contractor, water main contractor, has finished all the mainline uh, installation and tie ins, and he's starting to work on water service connections to each of the houses. He approximately has 80, 86 house services to, uh, to complete, and he, his proposed schedule is completing that in the next three weeks. Um, overall, I think he's done a, a great job. Uh, we've, it's been tough coordinating, obviously, with shutdowns and, and other utility contractors working in the street, but um, the project is moving along smoothly and, and it should be completed uh, by the end of June. And then lastly, just on the water side, uh, we are we found we did get writ written response back from the DEP for our Water Management Act response order to complete responses. Uh, David and myself had a conversation with uh, the head of the department at, at Nero in, in Boston office. Um, talked about a few some of their comments back to us. Uh, They're looking some, for more clarification on some of our answers. Um, nothing that we thought we couldn't uh, respond in a timely fashion to. Um, the biggest one is the uh, biggest piece of the conversation was uh, a way for us to get more water uh, during our summer demand. Um, and they have a process that's in place, it's called mitigation credits. And now we're looking at with one of our consultants to see how much mitigation credits the town can achieve uh, by introducing uh, new harder stormwater standards or bylaws. Uh, doing infiltration and II, infiltration and inflow removal. Um, these are all credits that we can get one-to-one -one credits for gallons um, that we can increase our daily, uh, daily flow out of the plant and what we can withdraw out of the Middleton Reservoir. So we're, we're gonna be working on that uh, over the next couple of months. We don't have a timetable from DEP when it is due, uh, but we'll hope to get all those answers and, and responses back to them in a timely fashion. So, um, they can review it and respond back to us accordingly. And then lastly, just as uh, two other issues um, that we've, we've talked about, um, we still are keeping an eye on the emergent contaminants, the PFO and PFAS uh, that we uh, discovered at our wells. The DEP has released funding, grant funding for assistance for, the, for projects that help design and, and remove uh, those hazard, hazard contaminants. So we're working with a consultant right now to submit an application for a grant funding to do uh, either design uh, or, or retrofit to help us um, remove those, those con contaminants from our water system. And then lastly, we have uh, EPA has a America's Water Infrastructure Act uh, risk and resiliency uh, requirement that's due next uh, next year in June, June 2021, uh, we'll be bringing a consultant on board to help us uh, go over our emergency response plan, uh, make any tweaks to it, uh, look at our, our system as a whole, see if there's any things that we can do to increase our resiliency, uh, obviously deal with the issues that may happen during a pandemic and, and staffing, uh, kind of go, go through the whole gamut so we make sure that we're, uh, our water system is secure and safe uh, for our residents, both Danvers and Middleton. Uh, 
this point, I'll take any questions on, on the water projects that we have going on right now. And just a general comment. I, I can see you guys have been very busy. I, I've watched the progress up and down Hobart Street. Uh, looks like they've done a great job there. And the road work has been put back together fine. So uh, great job going on up there. And then um, I couldn't remember whether it was water or sewer that just finished some work on Sherwood, or was that DPW? Coming out of Frost Fishburg, was that us? I couldn't remember. Mr. Chairman, this is Steve King. Yes, that's uh, that's our project too. That's part of one of our stormwater projects, the Frost Ridge Brook uh, restoration um, between um, well, running parallel at Mass Ave between Sherwood or Coolidge up to Cabot. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I watched that progress. That's on my walk route. So uh, nice job putting the people's property back together too. And, uh, just really, really nice job. Well done. Um, anything else, any projects on the sewer side or all set? Yeah, absolutely. If no one has, uh, no one else from the, the board has any questions, I'll, I'll move right on to the sewer. Okay. Uh, for ongoing sewer projects, we have, uh, we have one, we have a wastewater collection CCTV project and cleaning for our sewer mains. Uh, that was contract 2019-26. That is looking at some of our east side of our wastewater collection system. Uh, National Water Main is our contractor for that project. Uh, they're roughly 80% done. They should be mobilizing uh, back with their jet trucks and camera equipment to start that project uh, tomorrow. Um, so they have a lot of the Walnut Grove Cemetery to do along Sylvan Street. And then they also have uh, the back section of, of Crane River, um, Hutchinson Drive, and Endicott Street to finish up for that project, and then they'll be complete. Uh, National Water Main is also on site and was awarded our CIP lining, annual lining contract, which addressed uh, what we call our Conant subsection two, section, Conant, Conant subsection two. Uh, that was everything from Conant Street over to Folly Hill across Route 128. Uh, they'll be finishing that project this week. Uh, they'll be substantially complete. Um, and everything's gone off pretty much without a hitch but since they mobilized back in mid-May. And uh, they have recently just were awarded our latest annual contract, which is 2020-17, uh, which takes the next phase of that project over, um, which continues from Kona Street West towards uh, Cherry Hill. So they'll be working on that in the next few months once we execute the, uh, the contract with them. Uh, for pump stations, we have uh, the, I'm sure you guys remember the Endicott Street or Chalet Court pump station project that we had to put on hold because of the bid prices that came in too high. Um, we reevaluated what we could do at the existing station. Uh, we hired our on-call service contractor to come in, and now we're in the process of retrofitting the, the pump station into a, a wet well submersible station versus a dry pit ejector station. Um, and we're hoping to get you know, a useful lifespan out of that 10 to ne next 10 to 20 years um, in time for the development that is proposed to go in at the, the old Denny site in Motor Inn. Um, at some point, we'll be working with them. They, they seem like they're moving along at a good, good pace that they'll start developing that project in the next few years. Um, so we're hoping once they're ready, um, we can then look at, at servicing them with a new pump station that would ultimately aid, aid them for their development and on us at the same time and see if we can have a partnership uh, in that project. Um, next project was West Street Forest Main Replacement. Uh, our contractor, Woodall Construction, uh, started mobilizing equipment uh, to the site today. Uh, they're going to start their erosion control installation and test pitting of existing utilities. And their plan is to start uh, relaying the new Forest Main um, in a new trench uh, next week, and he's uh, assuming about a two week span worth of construction work on West Street from Grace, basically up to Dayton Street uh, for replacing the, uh, the existing force main. Uh, so far, everything's gone well, and, and we'll see what we have. Uh, I'll probably give you a better update at our, our next meeting as far as progress with the construction for that project. 
And just as uh, Mr. Chairman had spoke about earlier, Frosher's Brook, um, that contractor is, is planning to remobilize fully back in the end of June to finish the last section of the Frosher's Brook uh, restoration project. He'll need to open up a few more easements that we have uh, through the Woodville subdivision area, and, and then he'll be able to mobilize and, and, and complete that project. This week he was in uh, restoring some of the properties that he no longer needs to access. Uh, that he started on the first phase up near Cabot Road. So he's gonna um, install lumen seed, uh, put new fence, put the new fences back and, and address the properties um, or work with the homeowners on getting them back to uh, the level of satisfaction that they're happy with that the lawns are, are restored. And that's all I have for the existing sewer projects that are ongoing. If anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll take them now. Thanks for a great update as always, Steve. Much appreciated. Um, I don't have any questions on any of those, those projects other than what I've said already. Uh, Justin or Mike, do you guys have any questions? And Mike O'Keefe, no, I don't have any. Very, very good job, Steve, thank you. Sorry, I was double muted. This is uh, Justin, Terry, no questions on my side. Thank you. Um, before we go to the last item, which we'll be trying to set our next um, meeting and then rate meeting, uh, are there any other items that need to come to the board for me? Mr. Chairman, this is David Lane. I, regarding the rates, I did want to um, mention one thing just to bring it into this meeting. So to get the board thinking, uh, we talked in depth about water uh, and the water rates, we kind of glossed over the sewer rates. The sewer rate table that you that you were presented, the, the summary table, uh, has three sewer rates increases that we've proposed to consider. One is a 4%, a 4.5%, and a 5% on the sewer side. Each one of those you'll see at, on the bottom line is a little different than water in that each of those shows us running in a deficit for the year. And that would mean we'd use a piece of retained earnings, depending on what which one of those percentages was chosen. Right now, we are in better shape with the retained earnings on sewer. A big reason for that is because of that Endicott Street pump station that we are not building at this time, uh, that now we think the development down there is likely to do that. So um, that money will go back into uh, retained earnings will be partially used towards capital projects, but um, those it looks like even with using a piece of the retained earnings, we need to um, look at that, you know, a similar rate increase on the sewer side like water, perhaps 1% lower. Any questions from the board? Right, Michael, you. Keith, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Um, hearing the silence, I would say we should move on to the next item, which would be to set our next meeting dates. So if people could pull out the calendars, we can take a look. Mr. Chairman, we had had a little information uh, sent back and um, a week from tonight on on um, June 18th was proposed. I don't know how that works for the board. Michael Keith, that works to me. I thought that was the that was the date going forward was the 18th. Yep. Yep. Still works for me. This is just Ontario. Right. So, so question from the chair would be, do you think you can get us revised financials in order for us, you know, in time for us to be able to look at it a few days before the meeting? I, I'm looking at Peter and Roddy, but I think get something to the board by the end of the day on Monday, if that would be enough, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would say no later than Monday. Great. 
we'll commit to the end of the day Monday for that. Uh, the recommendation for meeting time was to have the, the meeting uh, at 530, followed by the uh, public hearing at 6. Sounds good. Uh, only question from the chair. It, had some spirit of discussion tonight. Do you think we get all that conversation in a half hour to start right at 6, or should we give ourselves a little bit? Uh, we always have the ability. We could start the hearing a little bit later than what we advertise. We just can't start it any earlier. Okay. Peter, would you agree that the half an hour is good? Usually, it's good for the regular meeting. Peter, you think a half an hour will do it? Yeah, I think so, especially if we get the materials out and everybody, if they had a question, they could call and ask us too, you know? Okay. Yeah, okay. we do want to encourage, yeah, if the board has, you know, to email staff or send or give us a phone call. We're available all, we're available all next week. Okay. All right. Yeah. And if you remember what happened last year, I think a couple of us had a list of questions we sent to you and that worked out well. Yeah. So, so if we've got that list of questions again, um, send them directly to you, David. Yes, sir. yes, please. Okay, so uh, Michael and Justin from the chair, if, if you have questions, once you've had it, I'll look at the numbers on Monday or Tuesday, just send them off to David. And then um, maybe we'll start the 530 with a review of the questions that have been submitted. And, uh, start the meeting off that way. Okay, that works. Yep. Any final questions for anyone? If not, I'll entertain a motion from the board to adjourn. Uh, let me just do one final check, make sure we don't have any public comment. All right. Uh, yes, we do not have any public comment, Mr. Chairman. Okay. No right. public comment. Okay. With that feedback, um, motion to adjourn. Michael Keefe, I second. Okay. Thank you so much. The meeting has uh, concluded. Look forward to seeing one next week. And thanks, everyone, for your help on this matter. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Hey, have a good evening. You too.